Hey guys, Will here. Welcome back to the channel. Now, as you can see beside me here, I have a bunch of PC parts here, including a very exciting i9 9900K and Maximus 11 motherboard. Now, this is something that I'm really excited about because I've been wanting to get my hands on these components for many months now. So we'll be skimming over the actual build in time-lapse in this video, focusing on the unboxing of the CPU and the motherboard more specifically. And then we'll also take a look at the final overclocks that I'm able to achieve with the CPU, RAM, and motherboard. And then we'll do a separate video later on where I'll actually take you through all the settings that I've used to achieve those overclocks and how you can do the same kind of thing at home with your own system. Don't forget also, we do have our overclocking fundamentals guide on the way as well still working on that one that's going to take you through all the details of what the various different settings mean in very specific detail and stuff like that but for now let's get stuck into the build So time to unbox the motherboard. So very clean packaging as always from ASUS ROG branded products. They're always very, very clean and tidy. And the motherboard itself is a very clean looking motherboard as well. There's no crazy colorful gaming badging and all that sort of stuff on it. It's very understated and very professional looking, which I personally love. So underneath the board, we've got our sticker sheet, as we've come to expect from ROG as well. Every motherboard seems to come with a sticker sheet, which is always a good thing. We've got a little drink coaster as well. Our all-important driver CD. I'm surprised that they don't include those on a USB by now, but it is what it is. A cable mod voucher, a little certificate of authenticity, warranty booklet, and of course, the instruction manual as well. Now don't forget to lift the bottom up as well because there is some more stuff underneath. We've got a couple of SATA cables. Our SLI bridge as well for up to two cards. Also got a couple of addressable headers and extensions for our RGB lighting. A little header with all the connections marked for our case switches and a little bag of screws and adapters for our SSDs. So we'll get started by installing our NVMe M2 SSD. So we're going to use the top slot here. There are two slots and both of them have a heatsink which is really nice. Obviously heat is quite an issue with M2 SSDs. They can get quite warm quite quickly and their transfer speeds scale off quite quickly. So having a heatsink will definitely help to keep those temperatures down and keep our performance at a maximum. So we just undo the two screws, lift off the heatsink, install our shiny new SSD into the slot. Now if you don't already have a spacer installed or the spacer isn't in the correct position for your particular card, you might need to use one of the packaged ones, but in this case we were all set up ready to go. So remove the little protective cover from the thermal transfer pad. We can install this over the top of the sticker on the SSD because these are thermally conductive stickers. Place it down in place and then put the two screws back into position. Moving on to our RAM, now because we have a two DIMM configuration in this particular setup, we want to use the slots marked A2 and B2, which are the first and third slots as shown here. So just install the DIMM slots as shown, push them down to click them into position, making sure that you have the keyways set correctly, and just click them in like so.
Now on to unboxing our CPU. So this is definitely the most outrageous packaging that I've seen from Intel. I would say that this is without question a reaction to the Threadripper packaging that we saw from AMD. So it's good to see a bit of healthy competition. Definitely over the top, but nonetheless, it's nice to have something kind of cool when you spend that much money on a CPU. So we pop it open. The CPU is housed inside like it's floating in space. Lift the lid off. You can now access the CPU. From here on, it's pretty much the same as we've had in various different packages previously. So we take a little manual out. We've got a little sticker on the back as well to signify ninth generation. And we can go about installing it in the motherboard. So we release the little socket. We remove the plastic clip. Now, obviously we need to be very careful here not to bend any pins. So being very careful to handle the CPU only from the sides so as to not get grubby fingerprints on the top or bottom, we place it into the slot using the keyways. Now this does require quite a bit of force to push into position, but you'll be able to feel if you're doing something wrong. Nothing should move around and it should all slot in as shown very, very simply. And that's it, CPU is installed and the motherboard can now get into the case ready to have the cooler fitted. So with our backplate and mounting screws now in place, it is time to install our thermal compound. So usually about the size of two or three grains of rice is enough. Now note that I am installing an H100 cooler, which does come with a pre-installed thermal pad, but because I'm reusing this cooler, I don't have any thermal pad on there. So that's the reason why I'm using thermal compound. So we drop that in place on top of the screws. And now very importantly, we want to just tighten these screws up enough that they're starting to bite and then go around in a cross pattern as shown. So horizontally every time. And this is to make sure we're exerting even pressure across the surface of the entire CPU and not pushing down on one corner. So keep going around diagonally until all the screws are fully tightened. Okay guys, good news, everything worked. We've installed Windows and we are up and running. But before we get into that, I just want to quickly reboot into the BIOS quickly because I want to show you a couple of cool things about this motherboard. So we'll just reboot quickly here now. Jump into the BIOS. Okay, so you'll notice here I do actually already have an overclock set and I'll take you through all the details of that in the next video. So stay tuned for that. But I just want to show you a couple of cool things about this motherboard that are upgrades over the previous Maximus X. So over on the right hand bottom side of the screen, you can see there's a window there that says prediction. Now this is basically a really clever overclocking tool. Now I'm not really sure how I feel about this because it kind of, it takes a bit of the skill away from overclocking. But I think for, for beginners that are just, you know, wanting to get the best settings possible out of the box, this is actually a really cool feature. So over here, it has a percentage of silicon quality. Now I believe that is calculated from the SVID table of the CPU. So it's not actually, 
you know, there's no there's no indicator there on the CPU that it's reading from the chip to tell it what it's binned as or anything like that. It's not that clever. The SVID table is something that's built into every current CPU and it basically tells the motherboard roughly what voltage it's going to require for every clock speed throughout the frequency range that it would normally operate under Intel's conditions. And as you'll see in my overclocking video later on, there's a couple of tweaks that we can make on ASUS motherboards around that. So I believe that it's using that value here to calculate the silicon quality. It's not reading a bin code or anything like that. It's not that smart. And then we also have cooler points here as well. Now this is really cool. What it does is it actually logs your temperatures as you use the computer. So as you're doing your benchmarking, as you're gaming and things like that, it measures how efficiently the CPU is being cooled and then it awards these points based off that. Then it uses these points to actually calculate how it predicts you'll be able to overclock the CPU based on the cooling that's available here. So it's also predicting here that for a non-AVX 5 gigahertz clock frequency, we're gonna need about 1.26 volts on the vCore. For our AVX, it's for 4.9 gigahertz, which is what I've got it set here with my negative offset. It's saying we'll need 1.276 volts. And then for a cache frequency of 4.5 gigahertz, which is what I've got dialed in down here, 45 for my cache ratio you'll see it's saying that I'll need about 1.11 volts to be stable. Now it's also calculating here what it thinks my maximum stable cache frequency is gonna be, AVX stable and non-AVX stable load. So that's a pretty cool little tool to at least get you started with overclocking. Now obviously you're gonna be able to fine tune a little bit beyond that. It's not based off real world numbers or anything like that. It's not reading off the CPU bin codes or anything like that as I mentioned before. So while it's not actually calculating this stuff off a special code inside the chip or anything like that, what it is doing is it's monitoring the system at all times while you're using the computer and then adjusting the calculations based off that. So what can we actually do with those predictions? Well it gives us a good idea for a base point for overclocking if we're starting from scratch with our manual overclock, but it also allows us if we scroll down to AI features here, we can actually use those values to adaptively set our overclock automatically based off its own measurements. So what that means is that as your cooling slowly degrades over time, so as your thermal paste degrades or as you start to get dust build up and things like that, or maybe a fan dies, the system will actually measure those differences in temperature and adjust the overclock to keep things stable without you even realizing that this is going on. Now this is both a good and a bad thing because it could mean that you're getting less performance and you don't even realize that it's happening. Whereas normally with a manual overclock, you'd get blue screens or you'd get freezes, you'd realize that there's something wrong and you could go in and fix it. But for people that are just looking for a stable system that runs as best as possible with minimal maintenance, this is a really cool feature. So I'll cover all of this in a lot more detail when we do our overclocking video. So other than those new features there, it's pretty much identical in terms of BIOS settings and things like that to the older generation Maximus boards. But I just wanted to quickly show you that because that is a really cool feature that's now built into these boards. So let's boot back into Windows and I'll show you quickly what we're able to achieve with our overclocks. Okay, so after an hour and a half of stability testing, you can see we have an overclock of 36.1% with a clock speed of 4.9 gigahertz for AVX load and five gigahertz for non-AVX load. And we've been able to achieve this with a V-Core of around about 1.3 volts with load line calibration set to seven. Now, if one thing that I did just wanna quickly mention here is you can see in OCCT, our V-Core voltages are reading a little bit low. Now, I noticed that with the Z390A motherboard as well, but you can see our temperatures are all well within the tolerable limits and we were temperature limited with this overclock. The CPU would definitely go harder with a higher voltage, but once I started to push into higher voltages, I was running into instability and thermal cutoff and things like that. So we'll stop the testing now at an hour 30 and quickly have a look at the results here in a bit more detail as well. Okay, so we can see here that our CPU temperature took about 10 minutes to stabilize. So it was rising for about 10 minutes, which we would expect coming off idle. And then after that point, it was just fluctuating in line with the load that was placed on the CPU by the test. It's not a constant load with OCCT, but you can see from that point on, it's completely stable. It doesn't rise up any further for the duration of the test all the way up to 90 minutes. So we know from that that we've got nice stable thermals for our CPU as well, which is very, very encouraging. Okay guys, so the only thing left to do now is a quick benchmark to see how this system compares with a relatively similarly spec system. So my desktop computer that I run every day actually has exactly the same RAM, exactly the same type of SSD, but it's running an 8700K instead of the 9900K. So I think it should be a pretty interesting comparison for most people that might be thinking of upgrading or not sure which one to go with even. So my 8700K for comparison is running 5.2 gigahertz 
at um, no AVX offset at all, so 5.2 gigahertz across six cores. Whereas this one is running five gigahertz non-AVX. Now Cinebench isn't an AVX instruction set, so it'll run at five gigahertz when we run the test. And that is across eight cores here. So I'm expecting a score, hopefully around sort of the 2100, 2200 range, but let's hit go on it and see what we get here. So we see our eight cores dancing around there. Our voltage has dripped down to 1.28, which is still within the acceptable range and everything looks to be stable. It's looking pretty quick. It definitely looks quicker than the 8700K. What do we get here? 2186. That is a very, very, very respectable score. That kind of makes me want to upgrade. I mean, in the real world, it's a very negligible difference between the 8700K and the 9900K. Essentially, the 9900K is just an 8700K with an extra two cores strapped to it. So if you're not utilizing those cores, if you're primarily playing games and stuff like that that don't use multi-core enhancement, then you're probably not going to benefit from a 9900K over an 8700K. But nonetheless, that is a very, very respectable score. Now, I do just want to quickly mention as well that this score might be a little bit higher than you might get with the same configuration. That's simply because I'm running a completely fresh installation of Windows here with only the essential drivers and software installed. So I don't have any other services or anything like that running in the background. So if you do get low scores in Cinebench, I always recommend installing a fresh copy of Windows on a separate hard drive or a separate partition or something like that that you only have the drivers installed on just to make sure that everything is running at its absolute maximum and there's no other things hogging system resources. But that is a very, very good score. So guys, that is it for this video. I'm very happy with the results that we've got. As I mentioned before, definitely the bottleneck here is the cooling. So if we were to increase the cooling capacity of our system, so if we were to add a custom loop or something like that, we would definitely be able to push a little bit harder. I definitely think that five gigahertz at around sort of the 1.32, 1.33 volt range would be possible with this chip. Maybe even 5.1 if we push up towards the 1.38 volt range. So kind of similar to the typical 8700K processor as well. But because of those two additional cores, there is definitely a noticeable increase in the amount of heat that's generated. So if you really want to get the most out of your chip and motherboard, I would definitely recommend high-end cooling. There's not really a whole lot of point in going out and forking out a lot of money for an expensive motherboard to take full advantage of these chips if the cooling isn't up to the task. Okay guys, so that is it for this video. If you're interested in the settings that I use to overclock this CPU and motherboard, do check out the video that's linked above my head right now. I'm posting it up at the same time as I'm posting this video to give you guys the maximum amount of information. So check that video out. Do stick around as well and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss our overclocking fundamentals course. I'm really excited about that one because there's not really anything like it available on YouTube at the moment. I'm gonna take you through all the details of what all the individual settings mean how they influence each other. We're going to talk about the electronics and the principles of electronics behind overclocking. We'll be talking about things like adaptive versus manual voltage control, VRM temperatures, all that kind of stuff. So lots of content there to get excited about. But thank you very much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.